So class one, we're really going to cover uh, mastering and the mastering process, right? So we're really going to talk about what is mastering. Um, and this is important to define because I think it's very confusing to people. People think when they've finished mixing a song, it's basically ready to be released. And uh, so defining what mastering is is really important. Okay, and so we'll go over that. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. We'll define the difference between mastering and pre-mastering. Go over the evolution of mastering, so how mastering has evolved over the years. A history of loudness, right? Because this is such a big thing in terms of the way mastering engineers work with audio, right? Um, artists and record companies and people who have uh, paid interest in the success of a product, the product being the song or, or the music that's being released commercially, um, they want to give it every best chance to succeed. And so uh, there is this thing about your song being at least as loud, if not louder than everybody else's song, that somehow makes it more accessible. And there's pluses and minuses to that. So we'll get into some of that. And we'll talk about modern mastering techniques. So while I'm really drawing on a lot of professional experience, and, and I'm going to be showing you a lot of professional techniques for mastering, really uh, a lot of this class is going to be focused on how you can master your own work or even do mastering work for other people. Okay, so um, that is really kind of the focus here. So if you're producing and putting together your own work, understanding what goes into that next level of processing. Okay, and I'll explain that. And if you're working for others, that's actually better most of the time than doing mastering work for yourself. But, you know, we'll explain that as we kind of go along as well. And then we'll go over a step-by-step -step process for mastering. So let's start by defining mastering. Okay, so uh, technically, mastering is the creation of the... Uh, of the actual physical product that duplicates or creates the uh, um, is the duplication um, uh, physical duplication uh, master okay that's used to actually stamp out the uh, product whether it's a CD or whether it's a vinyl record and so um, from that perspective that's what they call mastering although a mastering engineer technically is you know now what they call pre-mastering or what was called pre-mastering which is the processing stage so there's a stage in between the mix and the actual creation of the production master that stamps out the physical product that uh, allows the the um, the song or the music to be optimized so that you get the most out of it when you actually physically manufacture the product right so that's where the mastering engineers position kind of came into being right, was this transfer thing. It was actually called a transfer engineer. So um, really what a mastering engineer is doing is they're taking the final mixes that have been created maybe by more than one engineer and they're ordering them together. So it, you know, the mastering could be for CD release, it could be for vinyl release, it could be for internet release, right? So we're gonna talk about the differences there. So if you're releasing a single, then you can process the individual song and, and create it, uh, encode it, embed any metadata in there, picture files, ISRC codes, etc., and then ship it out onto the internet and, you know, get it out there so it can uh, be purchased on iTunes or whatever. Um, when you're creating a physical product like a CD, though, then a series of songs then um, take on a different thing because now the CD becomes a separate product all in, on, in and of itself that's independent of the individual song. So the individual songs make up that CD, but the individual songs are going to have their own unique characteristics. Some are going to be louder than others. Some are going to be brighter than others or duller than others. Right? The space between the songs is very important. The order in which you place the songs on the CD is critical. Right? Editing. The, the beginning and ends of the songs, right? Um, these are all things that are part of the mastering process. So it's not just about equalization and compression and maximizing levels and all that sort of stuff. Of course, that's an important part of the process of mastering. But uh, there is also another critical phase of this, which is making sure that all of the songs are ordered correctly. And part of this mastering process, particularly for CD, requires a separate software. And the separate software will have the ability to um, uh, in, uh, uh, embed in code information, CD text information, ISRC codes, which are uh, inter in the International Standard Recording Code. And this allows you to track sales on the Internet or track sales of radio playback. Um, 
And so this stuff can be embedded into audio files, and it can also be embedded into the CD. UPC codes or EAN codes, right? And, and those are, are the universal product codes, the scan bars that would be on the physical CD. That can also be imprinted into the metadata of the disk, okay? So these are things that are part of the process, right? Um, that make it all work. So in the end, the mastering engineer is creating a finalized product that will go out for uh, duplication, right? That will go out to create uh, what's called the production master. And that production master will then be used to stamp out the actual physical CDs or stamp out the vinyl discs, okay? Or whatever that is, okay? So that's the basic thing or the very basic step of the mastering process, right? So we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of mastering because from, say, about 1908, the early 1900s, when the 78 RPM vinyl disc was released, uh, that was really the beginning of real music recording, where it was commercially and, and uh, more broadly released. So people had the ability, really, for the first time to buy music. And there were wax cylinders and player pianos and things like that. But, um, but this was um, uh, really a first uh, viable commercial release, something, a product that people could buy. People could buy music. And up to that point, Everybody, you'd have to go out to a local performance, local jam session with musicians, or go out to a theater uh, to see music performed uh, by other musicians, right? So these were more, um, you know, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, right? So now listening to music at home outside of radio and all those sorts of things, which kind of came in uh, and, and a lot of music, this would be the way where you could selectively decide what music you want to listen to, purchase it, put it on your player and listen to it. And through all of that period of time, when a recording was made, it would actually have to be made uh, directly to that vinyl disc. So what they would do is they would actually have what would be called a cutting lathe. And uh, I actually have a, a picture of one here, uh, somewhere, right over here. And uh, this is like a picture of a cutting lathe. And so you would actually feed um, audio signals into this cutting lathe. And... Uh, what it would do is the audio signals would go to a needle, right? So you'd have this lacquer disc. So this disc is not 12 inches. It's actually much bigger than that. It's like 14 inches. And, um, you know, for a regular 12-inch vinyl record, uh, the 78 RPMs were slightly smaller than that. But uh, what would happen is you would have this needle that would cut grooves in this um, uh, vinylite. And uh, what would happen is these grooves would get cut out, and there would be a vacuum that would suck up the stuff that's cut away. And sometimes the head was heated, right, so that it would cut more cleanly and accurately. And you would actually feed the audio signal to this, and it would actually create mechanical movement of this cutting head that would cut grooves into this vinyl record. Now, in, so the audio went straight into there. So when you set up musicians, generally they were much more distant from the microphone, right? They had to be, because if there were any sudden peaks, too much low frequency, uh, etc. Certain things would cause the cutting head to act erratically or to overcut or to undercut and they would either create noise, uh, distortion, ruin the disc, right? So you had to, the, the actual recording process was uh, no fun thing for the engineers that, that cut these records because you may get the perfect musical performance but if you screwed up the cut on the actual cutting lathe then everything would be lost and so this process um, you know, really was a kind of a difficult thing, right, that happened, you know, as, as part of the recording process. And it wasn't until 1948 when analog tape machines were brought into recording studios that uh, the position kind of, uh, which became the real um, first mastering engineer position, they called it the transfer engineer, came into being because now the engineer could record to analog tape. And now this made things a lot easier because, one, the analog tape was less susceptible to being ruined. Uh, you had more time on the analog tape. Uh, the, we're switching over from 78 RPM records to uh, um, 33 and a third records, which had more playing time. And, and not a whole lot longer later, they added in the RIAA curve, which allowed the, uh, you know, a side, one vinyl uh, side of the disc to be up to, you know, like 24, 25 minutes. Right, so that significantly increased the amount of time on the disc itself. Right, um, so uh, okay, so let's see. We're actually uh, Siri mix away. Right, so uh, go to. Uh, I'm going to try to help you here. Um, 
uh, go to the uh, the phone icon, right? And uh, click on it. All right, so I, uh, I you know, just kind of throw, I'm just going to throw that there, and, and that should uh, get you uh, the audio. So see if that helps. So I'll kind of go on and, and see if I can help you here. Uh, John, who's normally here to help, can't make it tonight. So, um, so anyway, so when we actually, um, uh, um, you know, when they actually started to do this process of recording on analog tape, it made it easier. They could record longer. Uh, and figure out ways to deal with it. And then the transfer engineer could take and process the audio on the way to the cutting lathe. So they could they could equalize it. They could compress the audio signal, right? Uh, they, um, uh, um, you know, could do things along the way in terms of the gain structure to make sure that the actual... Uh, um, uh, that the actual audio transferred well, right, over to the vinyl record, and this made for better recordings, right? So, uh, see if I can type a letter and talk at the same time. Uh, so, let's see if, uh, you know, let's kind of, you know, move along here with this. So, that's the basics there. Uh, it, now it's green, still no audio. Okay, should be red, right? So, that should be red. Okay, and uh, the other thing is to go to your preferences, right? and go to your phone panel all right and uh and then you should select built-in input yeah yeah so it should be red all right so see if that helps so you gotta uh check the preferences okay so uh, usually, uh, normally with the classes, we have uh, our uh, moderator, John, who actually has his own uh, website or his own page on the website uh, there, the moderator, it's called. And so he's a crazy guy, but he comes in and he helps out with this type of stuff. But So I'll try to do this and kind of keep this all together here. Okay, so uh, basically what happened is mastering evolved from there, right? and the mastering engineer came into being, and then new equipment was created, better cutting lathes were created, uh, there was actually increased console technology, right? So uh, when we started to get into, uh, you know, they started to develop mastering consoles, right? And a mastering console was almost more like a DJ station, right? Um, uh, and, you know, you would actually crossfade, you would have, you know, your side A or song one and song two, and you could have separate equalization and compression settings, and then just crossfade from one side to the other, and uh, in between the songs, right? So when you actually put your master together, it you would actually set the song order and spacing with all the mixes on analog tape, and then you would cut the amount of space that you wanted in between them, and then you would actually set up one side of the console with the EQ settings for song one, the other side with the settings for song two, and then when you switched over to the other side, you would reset the settings on the left for song three, and you'd keep fading back and forth that way, right? And then that would continue to kind of go, um, you know, so that you could actually, you know, get through a whole side of a record. And, you know, there were a lot of limitations for working with records. And again, you know, this is not really necessarily the whole subject matter of, you know, the mastering workshop here, um, you know, we're, I just kind of talk about it just to kind of give you a brief history about what it's about and understanding where it came from, where it evolved from, okay? So um, when we actually get um, past that, what happened uh, going into the 50s and 60s was that uh, the jukebox, jukebox manufacturers um, would uh, release, you know, jukeboxes for, um, you know, for bars, they would release them for uh, restaurants and things like that. And uh, these things were placed in, and whoever owned the venue could actually set whatever the volume that they wanted people to listen at. And what they noticed is that some songs would play louder than others. And the same thing was true with radio stations. So they found that what happened was, you know, if they played a certain song and it was louder, people would respond to it more. And, of course, they responded to it more. It didn't take very long for record companies to catch on to this and for artists to catch on to this. And this started the kind of beginning of the history of the loudness wars. 
So really, uh, what it amounted to was, let's try to make our music loud. But the tools that we had to work with were limited, okay? So a lot of this had to get more into the tools that the mixing engineer was using and the mastering engineer in terms of the way compressors were used. So we don't have, like, they didn't have, like, the limiting technology that they have today, right? So you'd either just brutalize it in terms of uh, the way that the... Um, you know, just really hyper compress it, you know, just really slam the compressor, but that would really degrade the audio quality, right? So, you know, it was only so far that they could go. And then it really kicked up a notch when you got into digital, because once you got into digital, then you could start to create processing that was numerical, right? It was simple. You didn't have to actually create a series of physical components that would have to achieve these almost unrealistic characteristics. And, um, and although there were many amazing products that were created, it wasn't until digital that you were really, really, really able to crank up the volume. And, uh, and so this has been something that has always been an annoying thing for mastering engineers, because mastering engineers really are kind of audiophiles by nature. They really appreciate good quality sounding music. And uh, they're more likely to be the person that sits down between a pair of speakers and just listens to music, right? Enjoying music. Uh, and they'll spend a lot of money in that, right? In terms of that type of work, right? Uh, so the, the process of making things louder, right? Uh, kind of is something that kind of rubs uh, most mastering engineers as you're going along. Now, the reality is, is that the way that we listen to music now is completely different, okay? And so the modern mastering process involves maximizing the gain for several reasons, not just because you want to be louder than everybody else, but also because you need to achieve certain levels that will take you above the average noise floor of the way people listen to music. And music, for most people today, is a secondary part. It's an adjunct to other things that they do. So if you're listening to audio, uh, you know, with headphones and you're out, you know, side, maybe you're running or whatever, you have your earbuds in, then you got all the noise from the street, from cars and other things that are going on in the area. So you're more likely to turn your headphones up louder, okay? And that's not a good thing for your hearing in particular, but uh, when you're listening to music, you don't want, you know, generally you don't want to be adjusting your volume between every song. Okay, and what happens is when you preserve a lot of the dynamic of different types of music um, and you're out there with a high noise environment like that, you lose all the detail of, of the music. Okay, um, and so what ends up happening is that uh, you, you don't really hear the detail of all of the music, right? So there's actually a real severe loss of audio quality. This is true when you listen in your car right, and men, any of the other many ways that we listen to music, right? The noise floor of our general life is much louder than it was, you know, 20 years ago, right, or 30 years ago. So, um, so things have changed dramatically. So part of modern mastering process is maximizing that gain, but doing so in the cleanest, most transparent way possible. And these are things that we're going to, um, you know, get into, right? We're going to really try to, you know, show you how you go about that process of really making your music stand up to the standards that are set in the professional recording industry um, in terms of commercial releases so that you're viable, you're right up there, but you're not distorting the crap out of everything. And that's really a, an important thing. So let's go over the mastering process, right, and, and kind of what it is step by step. Okay, so uh, a lot of what you will see when I work here is actually on, on my sketchbook here. And so what really I do is I can draw a lot of things up here and then we'll, you know, we can go over, uh, you know, many of the different things that, uh, you know, we like to do, you know, uh, just in terms of uh, telling you what it is that I, you know, uh, whatever it is I'm talking about, I can draw some things up here that will help kind of make it more clear what I'm talking about. So when we actually start the mastering process, one of the first things that we're going to do is going to import the audio files, right? Uh, oh, God. <laughs> All right, so learn to spell here a little bit. All right, import. All right, so we're going to import the audio files. And so for the most part, we're really going to be talking about here is all digital, right? We're going to be working all with digital files. 
and uh, because that's really the vast majority of what it is that we're doing. And if you're dealing with analog and you have an analog tape machine, then the process of importing the audio is coming through the highest quality converters that you can on the way into your host application, right? So you want to get the best quality capturing of that. So we're going to import the audio and, and then we're going to analyze it. And, um, and by analyzing uh, the uh, music, here, what we're really going to do is we're going to look at a variety of different characteristics of the sound. And one of the main things that we're going to look at is the imaging quality, right? Uh, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but we're going to talk a, little, a bit about uh, the 3D sound field, right? So when you listen to the music, you will hear things in a lot of different ways, right? You'll hear uh, the sound not just between the speakers, or maybe that is the way you hear it, but you should be able to hear it uh, below the speakers, you know, down here, whether you have a subwoofer or not, outside of the speakers, above the speakers, out in front of the speakers, or behind the speakers. There should be some depth and body to it. And if you get a mix that doesn't have that, that is going to be one of the main goals that you can have in terms of working with the audio, right? When you're moving forward, you're really going to be working with um, uh, creating or finding, using all the techniques that I'm going to show you in terms of equalization and compression and uh, stereo imaging techniques and all the things I'm going to show you to help kind of open up the sound, right, of the music so that it escapes the speakers because that's really the key. And if you get that to happen, then what happens is all of the maximizing of gain and everything tends to be more transparent and it translates more uh, easily from speaker type to speaker type okay so when sound is purely stuck in the speakers right so if we have everything stuck here between the speakers like this and a lot of the mastering work that I do the audio is all in between here what happens is the mix can sometimes be very good the balances are good the frequencies are good you know the general layout of it is all really tight and nice but what happens is, is that it sounds too bright on this set of speakers, sounds too dull on that set of speakers. And it's really subject to the actual um, frequency response characteristics and the quality of the components that you're putting it through. Okay. Now, when we open up the sound, right, and we're able to expand it up and down, uh, front and back, outside of the speakers, then all of a sudden what happens is that you start to hear the detail of the individual instruments more. And so they can be warm, they can be bright, they can be rich, you know, dull, whatever, whatever characteristics they take on, you can actually make that translate to any set of speakers. And what will happen is that the frequencies on one set of speakers may be brighter than another set of speakers but the basic imaging characteristic will stay the same it'll still hold together your instruments won't go out of balance from each other sometimes if you play a mix through a uh, bright speaker certain instruments will stick out more than they do on another set of speakers right maybe the bass sticks out more on a particular set of speakers than it does on another right and a lot of this there's so many variables in that get involved with that. I won't even go into it all because it's too much to really get into for, for this, for this preview class. But this is really going to be the fundamental concept that we're working with, is right, working with the audio, right, in such a way that the sound escapes the speakers, right? And so that's really the key. And another way of, of looking at this, and if I just kind of change um, this graphic here, you know, if you're looking from the top side, I think I have an angle view here, right? If we're looking at the audio here from this perspective, we can really go down to the floor, up above the speakers, behind the speakers, outside of the speakers on either side. And so you really get this 3D world that you can live in. And so by using many of the simple tools and understanding how they work, you can achieve these effects, right? So in the mixing workshop class that I teach, I teach you how to do this at the mixing stage, which is ideally the place that you want to do it, right? Uh, if you can do it, right? You want to do it at the earliest point possible, right? But, uh, you know, we take what you can get, <laughs> basically. So if you're mastering something from somebody else, and, uh, and it doesn't have those effects, then really that's what you're going to be working on, right? That's what you're really going to be going for or trying to achieve. So uh, let's see. So I did have, uh, I think my layer is right here. Nope. Okay. See if I could find my layer. Oh, well, I'll just pick one and uh, just start writing. Okay, so one is importing 
and then we're going to analyze the files, right? So, and we'll go over a, a mix mapping sheet so that when you actually get a file, you want to be able to import it and you want to be able to analyze it and then you want to be able to figure out what it is that you have to do with it, right? Uh, once you get it in, okay? Um, the next step in the process after importing, uh, and this you could do before or after, but basically you could do some basic editing. Okay, and this is really about editing the head and the tail of the song. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll trim up the beginning, uh, maybe chase the fade in the end. We want to make sure nothing is clipped anywhere along the way. We listen through the song. When we listen through the song, we're listening for a variety of things, not just the sonic characteristics, but distortion characteristics, right? Any problems. It may be that the file is corrupted somehow or distorted and needs to be reprinted. You need to analyze or figure that out before you do any other work. Once you've verified that the file is okay to work with, then you can start editing the file. So when somebody sends you a file, there should be a little bit of a gap at the beginning and some extra space at the end of the mix. So the mix should not be printed directly from the very beginning instantaneously and end right at the very end of the fade out. Okay, It should be a little bit of extra space there and that gives the mastering engineer some room to play with it. Okay. Uh, there are many problems that can happen in the editing process or in, in, in this where the fade out is too quick, uh, you need to add a reverb to sort of extend something so it sounds more natural, uh, the beginning is clipped, right? So these are things that we're going to deal with first. So generally these are done first because if any of this stuff is a problem, then you, know, you don't want to spend a lot of time on that or processing or getting anything else. You're going to need to get new masters printed. So the editing, and then uh, three, if it's a CD, you're going to set the song order, right? So you're going to set which uh, sequence that the songs actually come in. Now, usually, this can be followed up by the spacing, but I usually do my processing first, okay? So in, in the world of processing, uh, what we're really going to be uh, dealing with, and uh, my pen seems to be running out of ink here or something, uh, in the, on the processing world, what we're really talking about is we're talking about equalization, right? We're talking about compression. Uh, we're talking about uh, stereo imaging, right? we got imaging uh, processing that we can do, uh, which can include things like reverb, mid-side balancing, etc. And in these, the order and combination of these things will vary depending upon what it is that needs to be done. There's also some other things, which is uh, we can actually kind of put some analog uh, style processing on it, right? Uh, putting uh, tape emulation software um, or other, uh, other types of forms of analog warming technology, right? To add some depth and some body into the sound, right? And there are other things that we can throw in here, but the processing is really the next stage of it. And once we've processed, right, then uh, we can go about the process of spacing the songs, right? And this is called spread, right? So the spread is how much time that you have from one song leading into the next, right? So there's a space, there's a certain amount of gap, right, between there. If you're coming out of a very, very heavy, uh, hard-hitting song up-tempo, and then you're going into a ballad, you're going to want to leave more space so that the listener has time to settle down before that next song starts. Whereas if you're coming out of a slow song, right, and the slow song is fading out and you really want to kind of really wake up the listener, you can make no space whatsoever and have that hard-hitting song come in right afterwards, right, and sort of shake the head a little bit. So uh, the timings creates a flow for the record, right, so it becomes a whole separate product in and of itself, right? So, uh, um, you know, that's kind of what the next stage is, right? So the spread or the spacing that goes between songs. Um, uh, once we've gone through this, right, and we've verified all this, we may need to make some adjustments, then we'll need to kind of verify the overall, right? So we want to check our levels from song to song, right? So in the leveling from song to song is about adjusting the gain so that when you play from one song into the next, it doesn't sound twice as loud or half as loud. Uh, we want, we may want to also make some adjustments to the EQ so that when we leave one song, they may be very bright. We're not going into a song that all of a sudden sounds like very, very dull, 
okay? So this is like uh, this is like a big you know thing, right? So we're going to be leveling and kind of working all of those things out, and then on the end, uh, then we're going to be getting down to the final processing, right? And and the final processing uh, can actually include right uh, some limiting technology, right? You could do it on the individual files, right? But the final processing can can uh, will be our limiters. And right, so this is where we can maximize the gain, right? So we're going to maximize the output gain. And then we're also going to apply dithering, right? And we're going to downsample, right? So the dithering is a noise that's added in so that when we go from our 24 bit recording down to 16 bit, then uh, we're going to add some noise that helps preserve some of the audio quality of the original 24 bit recording. And that's the basic idea. And then from there, we're basically exporting the final master, right? Whether that's for a CD release or whether that's an individual single, okay? So these are some steps in the process, right? And depending upon the original files, we may also be downsampling, right? So when mastering, you always want to stay with the highest sample rate and bit depth that you can, right? So if you print a mix, for example, and your session is at 96 kilohertz, 24 bit you print your mixes at 96 kilohertz 24 bit so that when you actually the mastering engineer brings it in imports and analyzes the files they get the best quality when they apply the processing right it's done all at a higher quality because now the EQ compression imaging and analog emulation technology um, is going to uh, take on, uh, it's going to be more accurate, right? It's going to be higher quality, right? So that'll take on, uh, make the mastering better. And then at the very, very end stage is when you downsample and bring it down to 16 bit, okay? And the dithering is a big help in that process to preserve that audio quality before you go down. It does make a big difference uh, to the point where some mastering engineers will take when they import files and they will upsample them. So they will actually bring them from the lower bit depth and sample rate up to a higher quality. Even though it doesn't improve the quality of the original recording, the processing will be more accurate all along the way, right? So depending upon what forms of processing you do, that could be a huge help in terms of sonically, right, in terms of getting it all together.